Hi, and welcome back to Student Nurses Success, where we are committed to helping you earn that A plus in pathophysiology. Today's topic is the endocrine system. And I have to be honest, the endocrine used to really scare me and be seem difficult, but I've broken this down to some really doable things to learn. If you follow along with me, I think you will see that the endocrine disorders are easier to learn than you think. I've divided this into two maps, so make sure you view both part one and part two. Part one will cover growth hormone, thyroid, and parathyroid, and part two will cover ADH and the adrenal cortical hormone disorders. So let's get started with our blank map. A few things we should iron out up front. First, keep in mind that hypo means not enough of a hormone and hyper means too much. Second, we will discuss how disorders can be either primary or secondary in nature. Primary means that the actual gland is not making or is over making the hormone. Secondary means that the problem is at the site of the releasing hormone, which is often the pituitary gland, and that the releasing hormone is either making too much or too little, causing the main gland to make too much or too little. The endocrine system has some checks and balances in it, and most glands make a hormone based on whether or not the releasing hormone is being made or not. So in the case of a secondary disorder, the problem is at the releasing hormone site and really not at the main gland site. Although the main gland will react with either making too much or too little if the releasing gland is not working properly. Third, an important piece of the endocrine system is to make sure that you understand what the actual hormone does in the body, and then you can easily make the connection of what too much or too little of that means for the body. In part one, we're going to cover growth hormone right up here, thyroid hormone right here, and parathyroid hormone. And what I've done here is listed in the map for you what these hormones are responsible for. So let's begin with growth hormone. What growth hormone does for your body is that it increases lean body mass, increases the release of glucose from the liver, it is responsible for tissue growth and overall growth, and it is released from the pituitary gland. So now let's talk about what it means to have either a growth hormone deficiency or a growth hormone excess. In growth hormone deficiency, it's going to depend on whether it's a child or an adult that's experiencing it. And so we have these nice pictures here in the middle of a little bit shorter person and a little bit taller person. In a child with growth hormone deficiency, you're primarily going to see a decrease in linear growth, meaning they're not going to be as tall. Now, an adult who develops growth hormone deficiency, you're going to see a drop in their blood sugar, decreased muscle mass, an increase in their cholesterol levels, and an overall increase in their cardiovascular risk. And that actually becomes the biggest problem here. And so in adults who have growth hormone deficiency, we may actually replace growth hormone we may actually replace growth hormone so that we can actually reduce their cardiovascular risk factors. And if you go back here, remember, growth hormone increases lean body mass, so not enough is going to actually decrease their muscle mass and increase their cardiovascular risk. Now let's talk about growth hormone excess or too much growth hormone. In a child, who has too much growth hormone, what we're going to see is increase in growth. They're going to draw, grow taller than they would normally have grown. Now, tall is great, um, all for being tall. However, if you are too tall, your heart can't pump to a larger than normal structure, your bones can't handle that larger than normal um, structure, and so it does pose a problem. So we really, there is a limit to how tall someone can be. In adults who develop growth hormone excess, it's usually in response to some type of pituitary tumor that is causing too much growth hormone to be produced in their body. What we see in them, because their growth plates are already closed, we actually start seeing a thickening of their bones. 
and this thickening and growth of their bones is called acromegaly. So you start to see maybe their mandible grow a little bit larger, thicker, their frontal um, forehead grow kind of coarser and thicker. You'll actually start to see um, an increase in their ring and shoe size. These are two sizes that really shouldn't change as we get older. So their fingers will get bigger, their sh um, feet will get larger, and so we do see this increase in growth, but it's more of a bulkiness of the bones and not a linear growth. Again, we will see an increase in blood sugar because growth hormone increases blood sugar release from the liver. So individuals with growth hormone excess will actually start to develop diabetes. And this growth can increase intracranial pressure, causing headaches and issues related to that. Now let's talk about thyroid hormone. Your thyroid hormone is a regulator of metabolism, and that's its main job, to regulate metabolism. Thyroid hormone includes T3, triiodothyronine, and T4, thyroxine. And your thyroid gland in your neck is what produces thyroid hormone. Now thyroid hormone itself, T3, T4, is made in response to TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, which is made in the pituitary gland. So your pituitary gland releases TSH when it senses low T3, T4 levels, and that stimulates your thyroid gland to make T3, T4. If you have enough T3, T4, then your pituitary slows down the production of TSH say, and won't produce as much because you don't need T3, T4. Let's begin and talk about hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism, or not enough T3, T4, is often called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. It's an autoimmune disorder where you attack your thyroid gland and actually kill it off, and so it cannot make T3, T4 in the same amounts. When you do not have enough T3, T4, so you've got decreased T3, T4 in hypothyroid, you start to see these issues related to slowness. You see a decrease in your metabolic rate, you see weight gain, you see decreased heart rate, weakness, and cold. Now what I have here is a little picture of a hippo here, and a hippo kind of supposed to help jog your memory to think of weakness, slow, weight gain, because um, he's, a, he's a little bit of a stout creature. Now let's talk a little bit about primary versus secondary hypothyroidism. In primary hypothyroidism, we know the problem is at the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is not making enough T3, T4. So we see a decrease in T3, T4. Because the problem is at the thyroid gland, the pituitary is actually fine, and it senses this decrease in T3, T4, so what it does is it increases the release of TSH, and it's trying to stimulate this thyroid gland to make more T3, T4, but it just can't because the gland itself is damaged in some way. So in primary hypothyroidism, we see this opposite effect. The releasing hormone is increased while the actual hormone is decreased. Now in a secondary hypothyroidism, the problem is not at the thyroid gland. The problem is at the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is unable to make enough TSH. And so if the uh, the pituitary is not able to make TSH, the thyroid gland never gets the signal and it doesn't make T3, T4. So in both cases of primary and secondary hypothyroidism, you have a decrease in T3, T4. But what's different is the TSH levels. In secondary, we see that the stimulating hormone moves in the same direction as the actual hormone. So they're both decreased. Now let's talk about congenital hypothyroidism. While we're talking about low thyroid, we should talk about congenital hypothyroid. 
Congenital hypothyroid is something you are born with. So this is related to infants. And so infants are born with not enough thyroid hormone because their thyroid gland is actually not working properly. They were fine up until while they were developing because mom was providing what was necessary for them for growth. But at this point, when they are born and they have low thyroid, they start to experience the effects of decreased metabolic rate. related to their lack of thyroid. The problem with this is that thyroid is absolutely necessary for development. And so the risk is if we do not replace this, the baby will develop intellectual disability and cognitive disabilities. So it's extremely important to identify this very quickly. And we actually identify this on newborn screening on our newborn blood tests. For those in babies that are born with congenital hypothyroid, we replace thyroid for them lifelong. Um, we do have to adjust the dose as they grow, so you constantly have to be drawing blood and monitoring their levels. But with thyroid replacement, they can develop very normally, um, and their cognitive um, development should be fine as long as the thyroid's being replaced properly. Now let's talk about hyperthyroid or too much thyroid. We call hyperthyroidism Graves' disease, and we can also cause hyperthyroid by giving too much thyroid medication. Let's say we're replacing thyroid for someone and we give them too much, we can actually cause what's called a thyroid storm, uh, which is just way too much thyroid. When someone has too much thyroid in their body, everything's very fast. We have an increased metabolic rate, weight loss, tremors. We see irritability, anxiety, and this thing called exophthalmus, which is actually a bulging of their eyes. So I have a little picture of this cute little chihuahua here, and um, that's kind of what I think of with hyperthyroid. I love dogs, I love all dogs, but the chihuahua, he's a little, he's a little hyper, isn't he? And so I think about hyperthyroid, and he usually has eyes that look a little too large for his head, so that reminds me of the exophthalmus. Now let's talk about the levels of T3, T4 in hyperthyroid. The levels of T3, T4 will be increased in both primary and secondary hyperthyroid because you just have too much thyroid. However, in primary hyperthyroid, because the gland is overproducing, the thyroid gland is just kind of lost its mind and it's overproducing T3, T4, the pituitary shuts down and the body says, well, I don't need to make any more TSH because you have more than enough T3, T4. So you see this opposite direction again. For secondary, that means the problem's at the pituitary gland. And a lot of times with secondary, there's some type of little pituitary tumor that's causing the pituitary to overproduce TSH. And it's putting out so much TSH, and the thyroid gland is just reacting to that by making more and more and more T3, T4. In this particular case, we would want to remove that pituitary tumor or whatever's causing the issue um, so that it would decrease T3, T4. Treatment for primary hyperthyroidism or Graves' disease is a little bit more complicated. Um, at this particular case, what we do is we just remove the thyroid gland completely, and then we replace thyroid for that patient lifelong because we can control the amounts easier that way. So now we need to move on to parathyroid hormone. The parathyroid glands are located on the thyroid and they regulate calcium and phosphorus. An increase in parathyroid hormone causes an increase in calcium as it causes the bones to release calcium. It also causes the gut to reabsorb more calcium from foods and it acts on the kidneys by decreasing the calcium that is lost in the urine.
All three of these things serve to increase calcium in the body. As calcium levels rise, phosphate levels decrease and vice versa. So now let's talk about our disorders. The first is hypoparathyroidism. Hypoparathyroidism results in low calcium levels and high phosphate levels. This is more frequently seen as the result of neck surgery or thyroid surgery, where the parathyroid glands are disturbed, resulting in less parathyroid hormone being released, and subsequently results in low calcium levels. It can also be seen in autoimmune disorders when the body attacks the parathyroid gland. Manifestations include the ones typical of low calcium, paresthesias or tingling sensations, cramps, EKG, EKG changes or arrhythmias, tetany, laryngospasm, and high phosphate. And here you can see a picture right here, and that's supposed to kind of help you remember tetany, cramps, and paresthesias. Now, hyperparathyroidism is a little more complicated. Tumors in the parathyroid and thyroid gland would be a common cause. Hyperparathyroidism would result in high calcium levels, which would manifest as arrhythmias, weakness, lethargy, even bone fractures as there is continual loss of calcium from the bone. We may also see the development of kidney stones. You see these here. And this individual looks weak and tired to kind of help you remember. We also see a decline in phosphate levels. What is a little more complicated to understand is the relationship between renal failure and hyperparathyroidism. In renal failure, the reduction in renal function causes the parathyroid glands to overproduce parathyroid hormone due to the kidney's inability to activate vitamin D. And this leads to low calcium levels and triggers the parathyroid glands to compensate by continually releasing more and more parathyroid hormone and subsequently this increases calcium levels. Phosphate levels may not decline in this situation because of the renal disease and kidneys inability to excrete phosphorus. And there you go. This will be your completed map for endocrine part one. Remember to watch part two where we will cover adrenal cortical disorders and ADH disorders. And as always, subscribe and like our videos so you can keep up to date with all our new ones.